that wonderful song this evening. If you'll join me in your Bibles tonight, the book of John, John chapter number 10. I'd like to share a message that I pray would be an encouragement to the Christian tonight and a conviction to the one who may be here or may be watching by way of live stream who is lost tonight. It's a very familiar passage of scripture that we'll read this evening, but I pray that it would just be an encouragement to us. The last time we were together, of course, we had revival last week. Dr. Harper was with us. But the last time uh, you and I were together on a Wednesday night, uh, we were looking at the passage of Jesus Christ uh, being the light of the world. And certainly, I'm glad that he is the light. I'm glad that there is light in this darkness of the world that you and I live in. But tonight, we're going to again find ourselves in a familiar passage of Scripture as we make our way through the life of Christ of the familiar event. And though I'd like to make this disclaimer, though it's familiar to us, and though we've probably heard this message before, probably read this portion of scripture many, many times in our life, may we pause and allow it to speak to us, even tonight. Listen, uh, you folks are, are well trained and well educated, uh, but we ought to allow the scripture to speak to us every time we come to it. The Lord can uh, prick our hearts and show us something fresh. I'm, I'm reminded of 2 Timothy chapter number 3 where Paul is encouraging young Timothy here and he says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. So though he's learned these things before, Paul is encouraging him to keep on learning, uh, encouraging him to keep on listening and paying attention. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And I think about children who've grown up here in this church, well taught. I learned a lot of things from our former pastor, praise the Lord. But we ought to keep on learning. And though we've heard the story before, though we've heard the, read the passage before, may we be encouraged to keep on learning, you know, to keep on applying it to our lives. Second Peter that reminds us, wherefore, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 12, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. Though ye know them and be established in the present truth, yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. That's what Peter would say to the believers in his day. Though you know these things... May we be stirred. So tonight, as we read this very familiar passage of Scripture, may you and I be stirred by the Lord, be stirred by this Holy Spirit tonight. So we'll be in chapter number 10 of the book of John. And let's read a few uh, Scriptures here. Let's begin in verse number 1. And I'll read and then we'll make some application tonight. And I pray it'd be a help to us. So verse number 1 of chapter number 10, Verily, verily I say unto you, He that entereth not, by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they, wit, they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy, I am come, that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep, but he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, Whose own sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. 
And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and they shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This commandment I have received of my Father. I'd like to begin a message this evening that will likely carry over into next week entitled this, Our Good Shepherd. Our Good Shepherd. So let's pray together. Father, Lord, we love you tonight. And Father, as we think on the song that we just sang or we just heard sang, Father, about uh, you leading us in life. And Father, we think about your son, Jesus Christ, our good shepherd. Father, our heart is pricked and moved as we think about what all you've done for us. Father, we're unworthy of your love that you have shown upon us. And Father, we ought to praise you for all that you do each and every day. Every day, uh, your blessings are new in our life. So, Father, as we gather together this evening for this just a brief time, Lord, would you help us, Lord, to see truth about your Son, and, Father, to apply this truth to our life, and maybe even this evening, love him more as we leave than we did when we come in. So, Father, I pray that you would just uh, convict our hearts, Lord, if need be, and, Father, if there's one that's listening or one that's here that is lost, that does not know the Good Shepherd, that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that today, this hour, would be the day of salvation. Father, help us tonight. We surely need you. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' precious name, we do humbly pray. Amen. I read a story just a little while ago today when I was doing some final preparations and studying on this passage. and I read a story about a group of pastors who went over to Israel. Now, we'll make some statements about Israel here in a little bit. Uh, we ought to be praying for that nation tonight. But these men had gone over to Israel, and they saw some shepherds in that nation. I can't imagine seeing that. Boy, it puts you back in biblical times when you think about a shepherd in that nation. And uh, his, his comments were this. He said he saw these three or four shepherds together, and they're walking down in this valley, and they see this whole flock of sheep. looked as if it's one big flock. But when they got to their separate paths or heading off to maybe their separate villages or separate homes or whatever it happened to be, the shepherd would speak and the flock separated. It's amazing. That would be amazing to see that those sheep understood the voice and the command of their shepherd. And as we look at our life today, Christian, we know who our Savior is. And the blessing is he knows us. He knows you better than you know you. Praise God for that. So tonight, may we see a few uh, illustrations and a few applications that will help us better understand our good shepherd. The, the question that we, if we were going to ask ourselves a question tonight, it would be this. Am I abiding with the shepherd? He's certainly here with us. He's certainly guiding us. The Brother Garrett, Sister Rebecca just sang a song about abiding. But are we abiding with him? Are we walking life's journey with him? So tonight, may we see a few powerful characteristics of the good shepherd, and may we be reminded of just how good he is and how much he cares for us. Notice with me, if you will, first, we see the shepherd's sacrifice. The shepherd's sacrifice. In verse number 11, we see Christ make a statement. Now, he is speaking here on this occasion to a group of Pharisees. He has just healed a blind man. He has just performed a miracle. And these Pharisees are upset. They're agitated. They're annoyed with the Savior. And he's going to begin to share with them who he is. And he's, first he speaks of being the door. And then in verse number 11 he speaks of being the good shepherd. He uses these analogies to help them understand it. They're living in a very agricultural society. They could get it right out of the bat what he's saying. However, they were blinded in their hearts. Many of them missed what he was saying. But he makes this statement in verse number 11. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. We see Christ express this in verse number 11. He expresses it in verse number 15. As the Father knoweth me, even so I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. So the second time he makes a statement of 
what he is willing to do. And uh, prophetically here, we see that he does do exactly what he says he will do. He's going to lay his life down for the sheep. And then in verse number 17, Therefore doth my father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. Well, that's a beautiful verse there, isn't it? Not only did Christ lay his life down, but he lives. The good shepherd lives tonight, took his life again. What a blessing to know that. Listen, there's no other religion in the world tonight that can say that, that their God lives, that our God lives. Jesus Christ lives forevermore. Warren Wearsby, he made this beautiful statement on this passage of Scripture. <clears throat> he says, during the old dispensation, the sheep died for the shepherd. But now the good shepherd dies for the sheep. He did not die as a martyr killed by men. He died as a substitute, willingly laying down his life for us. As we think about that, put our minds in the Old Testament in that dispensation. Think about uh, these uh, prophets and they, these priests and these other men and, and women. Listen, they had sin in their lives and there had to be an atonement for their sin. And thus, they would take a sheep or a lamb and take it to the temple. And there, there would be a sacrifice. It would be a blood offering for their sins. It's amazing now that that spotless lamb now dies for us. It's amazing to think about Christ, the shepherd king, laying his life down for you and I. I'm humbled by it every time I think about it. I certainly do not deserve the salvation that Christ afforded to me. My friend, I think if we were all honest, we would all echo that same sentiment tonight of how good Christ is. But we see he laid his life down willingly. Here Christ is exposing truth to these unbelieving Pharisees. Uh, we've seen it time and time again. If we've gone through his life, it's a constant battle with these Pharisees. And as we make application into our world today, right now, we're at a battle with folks who are unbelieving. They don't want to hear the gospel message. They don't want to receive the truth that is Jesus Christ. We're dealing with a generation of Pharisees, so to speak. But here we see Christ is going to offer that. Not only... Uh, to these individuals, listen, if they would have believed, they could have had salvation as well. But he offers it to the entire world. Every boy, every girl, every man, every woman can have salvation. And that is a blessing. 2 Corinthians 5.15, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. He willingly laid down his life for us and rose again. He is the good shepherd, and he's not a hireling, of course. He's not someone that's going to run off from the job. He did what he said he was going to do. My friend, he continues to be our good shepherd, even this night. Notice there's a few things that we can see from his sacrifice. He sacrificed because he loves us. He loves you, and he loves me. John 15 and verse number 9, As the Father hath loved me, so I have loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken to you that ye might have joy, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Think about that for just a moment. He laid his life down for you and I so that we can have eternal life. And not only that, but that we can have joy in life. I tell you, we're living in a time, uh, the news today, listen, if you watch the news today, you would just be blue in the face. You can't get gas in your car, Chick-fil-A's out of their sauce. All sorts of things are happening today. But we can have joy through Christ Jesus because he loves us. He sacrificed for us, sacrificed his life for you and I. He loves us. Not only does Christ love us, but the Father loves us. Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Can you imagine? Think about that for just a moment. We just celebrated Mother's Day, and Garrett was speaking so eloquently about his mother. And here, God, the Father, sent his precious, sinless son to be a sacrifice 
for the wretched sinner of this world. It's amazing to think about the Father's love and how much he cares for us, humanity. For there's no greater love than that, is there? No greater love than what he has shown to us. 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. That's why we love him. It's a sad statement, isn't it? That's why, you know, today's times, you know, someone does something nice for you, you're going to do something nice back for them. A lot of times it's just because that has happened. It's not that you're going to go out of your way just to be caring and loving, but God is so different than us, and we can't wrap our minds around it. I think about sacrificial love. Here we see the sacrificial love of Christ. Now, if we're going to explain this and, and put it in our vernacular, how we could understand it, I think about Garrett hit on it just a little bit ago. I think I left my notes up here or something. He was, he was all over them just a little bit ago. But I think about the sacrificial love of a parent, a mom or a dad. I think about a mom getting up in the middle of the night. We talked about this on Sunday, and she's right there with the baby. Or she's up early, and she's fixing the meals. She's working on many, many hours these days. But she's there. She's sacrificing for the child. I think about daddies. I think about daddies sacrificing their bodies, uh, their knuckles, their knees, their shoulders for their children. Out making a living working hard, sacrificing, self-sacrificing for their families. See, that's sacrificial love. They're doing that not because the children are going to say, Daddy, I love you, but they're doing it because they love the children. That's what sacrificial love is. That's what Jesus Christ has done for us. Our good shepherd in his sacrificial love, he laid it all down for you and I. We're undeserving of his sacrificial love. Tonight, as I look out on our congregation, I would say that most every person in here tonight is a saved individual by your testimony. So tonight, our heart, as we spoke in the beginning, we've heard this before, but our hearts ought to be stirred as we think about how much he loves us. Tonight, we ought to leave out of here loving him just a little bit more than we did yesterday or an hour ago because we think about how much he does really love us secondly tonight we see the shepherd's sacrifice now notice secondly we see the shepherd's relationship the shepherd's relationship notice when we in verse number three to him the porter openeth and the sheep hear his voice and he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out then notice with me in verse number 14 i am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine as the Father knoweth me, even so, I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. That word know, it, mean, it would mean this, to come to the knowledge of. That's what we see here. Christ knows you, and he knows me. I think about this. Uh, it's a personal relationship. I'll give you an illustration. Nicole and I met in kindergarten. We were five years old when we met. Met my wife at five years old. It's amazing. However, I didn't know her then. We knew each other, but, you know, I didn't know her, know her. So we spent the majority of our life together there at Nancy Reynolds. We grew, and she was a little freckled redhead. And we, we grow, and we develop, and we get to North Stokes. At that time, we, we went to North Stokes, and you started there in the seventh grade. You went till you were a senior. So here we are. We make our way to North Stokes. Uh, but our, our, our paths kind of diverted at that moment. So I really didn't see Sister Nicole again until 10th grade science class. 10th grade science class. And her schedule got all mixed up and she was put into my class. So we'd already been started for two or three weeks. Hannah probably knows all about these kinds of things with schedules getting confused in school. But here comes this red-headed, freckle-faced girl that I knew from years ago. And I said, man, you know, I'd really like to get to know her. I haven't known her in all these years. But though we, we knew each other, we didn't know each other. And even today, listen, I know I learned a little bit more about her each and every day. And I know some of our folks here have been married for years and years and years. You know each other like the back of your hand, don't you? But there's days you're like, wow, I just learned something new. Isn't that amazing? Well, as we think about Christ and Him knowing us, can I say something? He knows you better than you know you. 
He knows you better than your spouse knows you. But there has to be a moment in our life that we accept him. There has to be a moment in our life to where we receive him as our savior, to where we're in that flock. Because there is a passage of scripture that will break your heart. As you think about family members who are maybe lost, or you think about co-workers who are lost, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter number 7 and verse number 21, Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of the Father which is in heaven, many shall, shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done wonderful works. And then what I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. It's going to be a sad day. It's going to be a sad day that folks who have tried to work their way or earn their way to heaven, the Bible uses that word work. They've tried to earn a place in heaven, and they're going to get to that day of judgment. Say, Lord, Lord, haven't I done all these things? Listen, I, I came to church. I, was, I joined the church. I was baptized. Can I come in? The Lord's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. It's sad to think about that. But as we think about Christ knowing us, listen, once we're in the family of God, boy, he knows everything about you. Cares for you. Longs for you. I think about Brother Randy and Sister Sally, and they take care of their flock, of their sheep, don't they? I'm sure that they've got a couple sheep in their flock that they know personally. I'm sure they've got a couple rugrats that run around and give them a hard time and try to escape, try to go wayward from time to time. They've probably got some that may get sickly from time to time. Brother Randy and Sally pay attention to those things, and they care for their sheep. But it pales in comparison to what Jesus Christ does for you and I in our lives. My friend, he knows our needs. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our desires. He knows our frailties. He knows us personally. The book of Nahum, chapter number 1, verse 7. The Lord is good and a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. It's the God we serve. That's the good shepherd that we serve. John 17, 3, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Not only do we see that he knows us personally, but he communes with us daily. Listen, if you got up this morning and you did your devotions, or maybe you prayed, or you read your Bible, or whatever it was, Christ was dwelling right there with you. All through the day, you're driving your car on your way to work, Christ is right there with you, abiding with you. Now that's a good shepherd. That's someone who cares for us. That's someone who loves us. James 4, 8, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. I think about Abraham. Abraham, the Bible says, walked with God. He walked with God. The Bible goes further and says that he was a friend of God. Isn't that amazing? My friend, we too can walk with God. We too can have a personal relationship with our God every single day. It isn't rocket science. It isn't something that we cannot attain if we'll just trust him and follow in his steps. He longs for us, and we ought to commune with him. So we've seen this evening, we've seen the, the shepherd's sacrifice, and we've seen his relationship. What we'll do, we'll pause here this evening and we'll pick right up next week and we'll continue going through the Good Shepherd, our Good Shepherd. Pray it was an encouragement to you tonight as we think about just two of the qualities of our Good Shepherd. And may we even be stirred this week as we ponder that thought.